Hi, Dan Lynch again with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Today's forensics activity has to do with making your own wildlife forensics kit. So the items that I'm going to show you today are things that you might have around the house or you could get at a hardware store or possibly even a dollar store. So it's not going to cost a lot of money. But it's some cool things that you can do that you can put together that are similar to things that game wardens have uh, when they go out and do wildlife forensics activities. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that I have on the table. We're going to be collecting things. That's what game wardens do. They collect evidence, trace evidence, very small pieces of evidence. They might collect shotgun shells or spent rifle shells or maybe they look for a bullet or they're looking for hair or items that might be stuck on somebody's boot or their tires. And so you're going to need some sort of bags to collect things. So I have two different types. I've got, you know, typical plastic bags. The, the deal is with plastic bags, though, is you want to make sure that you never put anything wet inside them. Uh, because if you put it in uh, something wet inside your piece of evidence and you seal it shut, it's going to mold. So that's something you want to make sure that you don't ruin your evidence by putting anything wet inside a, a plastic bag. So if you have something wet, uh, you want to use some sort of a manila envelope or just a regular old envelope that you would mail things in. Um, that way, if it's wet, it'll dry in there, but the evidence will still be in there. And you can just write on the outside exactly what, you know, is inside. So um, I used just some labels here, and so I've got some deer hair in this particular one, uh, pine cones, pine needles, uh, a shotgun wad. Those are just some examples of things uh, that you might want to collect um, and store. So when you're collecting these things, all of those things that I showed right there, um, they're not toxic, they're not going to hurt you or anything like that. But if you do end up picking up anything um, that you're not quite sure of, make sure for safety's sake that you're going to wear some sort of uh, nitrile gloves or latex gloves when you do that. So since you're picking up tiny little things, you've got to be able to see them. Sometimes it's, it's very difficult, the things are very, very small. So inside your kit, if you had some sort of a magnifying lens, and I've got two examples here, really inexpensive, those are cool things for a forensics kit. To pick up those things, tweezers. Uh, you can either use plastic ones like these or metal tweezers. They're pretty simple to, to get and an easy thing to keep in your kit. I just happen to have a thermometer in mind. You know, I could take it out and I could just record the ambient temperature, the air temperature. At home, you're probably not going to be doing any forensics things with, act with actual dead animals, but real forensic investigators are going to be trying to determine time of death. So they're, they're going to use a meat thermometer in the muscle, but we're not suggesting that you do that on a home kit. Um, depending on what the item is, you might need a pair of scissors to cut it to make it smaller. Um, for recording information on your, on your, your crime scene, if that's what you're going to do, you might want to have an idea of you know, where you are or what direction some the tracks go. So a compass, learning how to use a compass is a great idea. Having a compass inside there would be good. Um, you're going to probably need to measure things. So, you know, something that's going to fit inside the kit would be a ruler. You might want to have a small tape measure. That would be a great thing to, to include in there. Something where you can do it in millimeters and in inches. A notepad, some pens. Um, these are um, shish kebab sticks that you could buy pretty cheaply at, at a, a grocery store. Uh, but what you can do, and what I did, is I had a can of paint, and this one happens to be yellow, and I just dipped them in the can of paint, and now I've got individual markers, so if I wanted to follow a set of tracks in the woods, and I wanted to be able to so show somebody else the trail, I could take one of these and put it at the back side or the front side of each track, whether it's a person's track or an animal's track, and then when I'm done, I could kind of step back, and I could actually see the trail. So that's kind of a cool thing to do to, to learn when, when you're doing some tracking uh, for either a person or an animal, and these are really inexpensive to make, and you know, you could put a, a much brighter color on there as well so you can see it better in the woods. Flashlight's a great idea to have. Maybe you're going to mark some sort of evidence somewhere. So a roll of ribbon, orange or blue ribbon is a great idea. Sometimes you need to label things. So just uh, masking tape's a great idea. And then, you know, besides collecting things in bags and in envelopes, Maybe you, you want to keep them for a longer time and you want to be able to display them or show them. So having some glass vials are a great idea, and I've got different ones labeled with things on here. Um, you know, you can also use just a Tupperware container, too. Um, so there's really simple things that you can do 
um, and collect at home to kind of put your own forensics kit together um, and then go out and collect things. Obviously, you're not allowed to collect uh, feathers um, unless you know you would have a, uh, it was somebody in your family who would legally hunted a turkey or a pheasant or a grouse, um, then you could have those feathers, but uh, you're not allowed unless you have a permit to collect those kinds of things. But let's say you found some deer hair or something alongside the road, uh, you could put that kind of evidence in one of your collections and have a, a pretty cool collection of evidence for your forensics kit. And any kind of container really work. Um, you know, this pretty much everything I have here is going to fit inside this tiny little plastic container, which you can label. Kind of a cool thing to do. Um, what we're going to talk about in a little bit is collecting fingerprints, which is also kind of a cool thing to do. Um, and we'll explain that in the next segment. Okay, so now I'm going to explain a little bit about how to lift a fingerprint. Our wardens uh, many times will use fingerprint evidence at a crime to try to um, see if a, a particular individual was at a location. And, you know, if someone was there and they committed a crime, uh, depending on what they touched, if it was in a house or a, uh, a vehicle or maybe on an antler or something like that, there's a good chance somebody left some fingerprints there. So they're going to try and lift a fingerprint that is peeled off with a piece of tape to be able to identify it against known fingerprints. So I'm going to show you how to do it, and it's pretty simple. Um, our wardens will use expensive fingerprint powder and a fingerprint brush, but I'm going to show you how to make your own powder. So what I did is I used a piece of charcoal, which is basically the same charcoal that you get from a charcoal briquette. You can either use it from your charcoal, or if you have a fish tank at home, many times you have the tiny little pieces of charcoal that go in the filter system. And they work really good, but you've got to pulverize it. You've got to get it really, really fine. So the best way to do that is to take the charcoal and double bag it. And in this case, I used two little Ziploc bags. And I put it inside there, and I used a hammer, and I pounded it down, and it breaks pretty easily. It's actually very lightweight. And then I used a rolling pin, and I ground it out to try to make it as fine as possible. And it is, the more fine you get it, the better it's going to work. So then you need some sort of a brush. And instead of a super expensive fingerprint brush, you can go to the dollar store and get a, uh, a makeup brush, which has, which has really, really fine ends to the brush. And the idea there is when you press down into the charcoal, it puts the tiny little fine powder on the end, and you can sprinkle it to actually show your fingerprint. So here's an easy way to do it. You want to use a, like a glass jar or a bottle or a bowl like I have here. And then I used olive oil, but you can use any kind of vegetable oil. I poured a little bit inside here, and I put my finger in there. And then you want to take a paper towel. You can see it's kind of dripping. Take your finger, uh, take your towel and wipe some of it off. And push it down on the glass and lift it off. It's kind of hard to see there right now. But if you take your fingerprint brush, and lightly go over top of the glass, you'll see it's starting to show up right there. So take, stay away from the actual fingerprint, kind of get some of that excess charcoal off of there. Then what you're going to use is packing, packing tape or packaging tape. And um, it's a clear tape, kind of peel it off, set it on top and smear it, like smooth it down on top of where your fingerprint was, and then slowly lift it off, and your fingerprint's on there. And then I made up these little tiny index cards. You can see one that I've already filled out here. It's got the case number, the item number, date and time, the offense, and in this case I put poaching down there, I'm the investigator, and I put county and township on there. And then you can just kind of put that piece of tape right on top of there. And it's not a perfect fingerprint, but there are some things that you can, you can identify on this fingerprint. The cool part is this. You could um, have some of your family members use something like this uh, cheapo uh, ink pad, and they could take either thumbs or index fingers, and they could all put a, a finger down on top of it, and then on a piece of paper, put their fingerprints on. So you could have different fingerprints, you know, right next to each other. And then what you could do is you could have one of them use the vegetable oil and put their, the same finger on the glass, but you don't know which one it was. And then when they're done, you use the equipment here and try to lift that fingerprint and then set it down to try to compare that fingerprint and see whose is whose. 
So it's just kind of a cool thing that you can do at home. It's pretty inexpensive. You don't have to go out and buy a lot of things. Some of these things you may already have at home. Um, somebody in your family might be willing to give up their makeup brush. Um, and if not, they're, they're pretty inexpensive to buy. So it's just kind of a cool activity that you can do um, with fingerprints. So in today's activities, we covered two things. We covered how to make a wildlife forensics kit using simple items that you might have at home or you could get at the dollar store or the hardware store. Some cool things where you can kind of collect evidence, uh, label them to be able to show other people the types of things that you collect. Very similar to what our wardens do when they go out and investigate cases. The second thing we did is we talked about fingerprinting. Uh, we talked about lifting a fingerprint and attaching it, making your own little uh, lift card. Um, we talked about real simple things about you know, making sure you use a glass a jar or a bowl, how to make your own fingerprint powder, and, and simple things that you can have at home to do something that our wardens do uh, lots of times when they do investigations. Hope you learned a lot today about making a friend's kit and uh, lifting fingerprints, and make sure to check out our other cool activities on our Wildlife on Wi-Fi page. Thanks for listening.